There are a, a lot of applications that are developed using various um, JavaScript libraries, and those libraries could potentially be really out of date. The JavaScript story was interesting because it sort of gave some statistics on the total insecurity of JavaScript in popular websites and uh, found 72 libraries that um, have vulnerabilities and did some analysis based on uh, top domains based out of the dot-com realm and also from, I think it was 75,000 from Alexa. So um, just pulled out some really interesting stats. You know, f almost 40% of jQuery libraries in these sites were found to be vulnerable. Uh, Angular JS. So this sort of hits close to home. Uh, my day job is uh, working with a software team and building security platforms. So we use tools like JavaScript and other programming languages that have libraries. And we try to be as you know militant as possible in patching and using the latest versions. But I can certainly understand how um, you know you could get out of date with your JavaScript libraries or any of the libraries for the code that you're using. This is the stuff you got to be really careful about. I mean, they, the researcher for this article basically portrays a, a just total mess of out of whack JavaScript, where you know the the recovery even wouldn't be easy to do because there's sites that are generations behind, not just patch releases behind. Right. So don't read it unless you're comfortable going back and changing your JavaScript after. But if the hosting company or the development team isn't keeping up with um, the libraries and patching their, their underlying JavaScript, then you get in this situation where cross-site scripting can happen, you know, any of these vulnerabilities that we thought were fixed. Yeah, well, and it, it can be <laughs> even worse than this. this. This article talks about JavaScript libraries, but, you know, Java libraries, you know, any other libraries that are used so in applications. Flash, right? Yeah, well, we're, yeah, we're not even going to go there. <laughs> yeah. But you know any of these any of these libraries that are used in application code any place, you run this risk because yeah. it's it, as you said it's not as simple as an OS patch, you know doesn't necessarily fix it. it you, you may need to go back and recompile the the application itself and you know do you still have the code to that application that's right. been running for you know six years and the programmer who did it has moved on. People need to patch their programming code. Use tools that check your code. Use uh, common sense in patching JavaScript, whatever you can do just to you know, keep from being in this situation where you're generations behind. It's not the Stack Exchange or any other uh, you know, third party code generators job to make sure that your personal website or web presence is secure, it's your responsibility. So, you know, if, if there's any question, it's on the developer or the designer to really go out and make sure for yourself that your stuff is secure. Application development is an ongoing process. It doesn't end when you hand off the, the application. When these libraries are later found to be vulnerable, is there going to be anybody around who can go back and fix them? Zero-day exploits are interesting. They're exploits that only one or, or a secret group of folks know about. Having a full treasure trove of information on zero days is kind of unique. Rand uh, did this study of 14 years worth of zero days that they've managed to get access to and the lifetime of these vulnerabilities. These researchers, I don't know exactly whose data set they got access to, they had access to some sort of a data well, that's, set. Let's, that's it's an interesting point, though. I mean, that's it was sort of eye-opening to me. The data set they got, you know, zero days are not easy to come by, right? Yeah. So somebody agreed to play ball with these researchers. So they got government at zero days. They got commercial zero days. They, uh, yeah, they had they had access to about 200 zero days, but the, covering like a 15-year period or something. Yeah, maybe. that's so that's pretty yeah. amazing. So that's what makes this kind of research, I think, pretty good and powerful. Yeah. And I think. Uh, Basically, they were trying to measure, you know, what is the shelf life of a zero day? And unfortunately, it's not uh, great news. Right. <laughs> Apparently, these zero days last for quite, quite well, a while. Well, it depends on how you look at it. They kind of couched it that it's this, the, the trade-off is that, you know, if only one group knows about the zero day and they're using it, you know, it's sort of to everyone else's benefit if it's not 
a bunch of groups using the same zero day. If, you know, if the government has a zero day and they're using it, then it's good that a bunch of other people aren't also tracking it down. A zero day is only as good as you, know, you can keep it secret. It, right. once, it, once it gets out, once people know about it, then somebody will f fix it and then it's no use to them anymore. But I, I did find it very interesting that they were saying roughly a quarter of the exploits won't survive more than a year and a half, right. yeah. but a quarter of them will survive more than nine and a half years. Okay. That's <laughs> scary, right? That is, that is really scary. Before I read this article, I would have thought something like this uh, would have probably lasted about a year or so, but uh, it looks like it's much longer. I thought six months, a year, a really good one, maybe two years. What was it? Only like 5.7% of them are discovered by somebody else within a year and a half. It's almost like a, a moral ethical conversation about these zero days. You know, what are you required to release back to the public and what is safer to keep, you know, secret? That's why there's a black market in them. You, yeah. know, there's, you know, a really good zero day will bring you a lot of money in the, you know, the criminal underground and the, yep. the, the dark web. Yeah. <laughs> they also talked about, I thought, I like the terminology they used uh, to define the zero days. They talked about there's the alive ones that are still usable, the dead ones, and the zombie ones. I guess they, they're still usable, but not in every version of the software or okay. things like that. And they had a whole bunch of terminology to describe exactly how the thing went from alive to dead killed by a researcher or killed yeah. by random refactoring of the code. Some of these things would frustrate me. For example, you had a really good zero day. It was working for you. You were using it for 9.6 years. <laughs> All of a sudden, they did a code refactor and your vulnerability went away by accident. And then some of these things, you know, they, they can be used forever technically because the older versions may not have be supported by the vendor. The software. Old software lives forever. You know, uh, there's, there's probably still COBOL software written yeah. in the 50s that yes. is being used in, you know. But I think some of this research is showing us that that's not the real root of the problem, that these things live on. The problem would be if somebody knows about them and then another group knows about them and it's being sold on the dark web, like you're saying, I think this research sort of shows that these things tend to be kept pretty close to the vest. Whereas a regular vulnerability might get patched in days, weeks, months, a uh, zero day vulnerability could be alive for five, six years and it may only be seen by one group and it might be the group that put the zero day out. The thing about zero days is by definition, you don't know about them. So there's no real good way to protect yourself from them. Depending on your environment, depending on your application, you need to think of creative ways to make sure that if one defense fails, there's another defense in place to pick it up. But you should design your system knowing that there's somebody out there who's going to try to break in. And they're going to do it in a way that you didn't anticipate. Hey Stan, you know, um, you've been doing a lot of work with the botnet analysis and trying to get a little better insight into what's going on with the botnet. So I thought it would be useful to kind of walk through the internet weather a little bit here with you. And then perhaps there are some things we should dig into a little bit more detail. So. You know, we've been tracking this activity with on port 23 for some time now. Yes. I think we're going to talk a little bit more about the Mirai stuff and what you're observing in that, uh, generally speaking. I think you know about the activity on port 22, that's SSH, so it's remote login and we have a lot of activity that's been going on for a long time. It doesn't seem to be going up or down any significant amount. And then this port 7547, you're familiar with that one. Yeah, I think that was the NTP server. Uh... The, uh, it's the CPE WAN management protocol. Yeah, okay. So they, like I remember that by how the exploit works. <laughs> right. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> right. So. so actually it's interesting in all these ports you mentioned are in some way associated with the potential botnet. So the right. 23 Mirai, I think 7547 we've seen with right. Mirai as well. 22 is Zordos. Zordos malware, it basically runs on Linux systems and allows people to create DDoS attacks. Looking at the uh, most sources probing, port 23, most of the sources on that one, uh, port 7547. Now, with the Mirai activity that you've been looking at, I think you've seen a lot of the 
devices that are scanning on both of those ports, is that right? Uh, yeah, there's a crossover, and you can actually see it on the pie chart too. So the number of uh, Mirai, I guess, infected devices that are scanning uh, is not the same as number 20, port right. 23. So there is actually different versions of Mirai out there now since mm -hmm. the source code was released. And so this was an addition to some of them. Um, and of course, there's obviously there's other people, uh, you know, not just Mirai, but other mm -hmm. botnet operators or malware authors are also scanning for these ports. Uh, so let's take a look at port 23 in a little more detail. I guess the good news here is that, you know, it's really kind of settled out looking at, at the top here, looking at the number of flows, and then at the bottom here, looking at the number of sources that are doing that scanning. We've seen a pretty good trend here. That is, it's been generally going down, less sources doing the probing. now. I don't think that means we're out of the woods. You know, perhaps there actually are less bots out there, but I think it could be that there, there's just re less recruiting activity. That is, as time goes on, uh, the, uh, the return for the investment in the scanning activity may be less. There may be more movement over to actually using the bots to do other things. They may be busier doing other things and perhaps not doing so much probing. Yeah, I think it's a combination, actually. So what I've noticed is in the hosts that we're tracking that are infected, they're doing much less scanning, mm. uh, especially on port 23. Slowing down, perhaps? Uh, or? Perhaps they're slowing down. Like you said, it might be uh, not enough return on investment. Maybe they don't want to be as noisy. Because mm -hmm. one of the ways that researchers are probably detecting these bots is because of the scanning activity. Yep. They're indiscriminately scanning the internet. Mm -hmm. So this allows everybody to kind of understand the scope. And I think some of the malware authors have kind of figured that out and are now trying to do things a little bit uh, mm -hmm. kind of more under the radar. Maybe only a certain set of the bots are now doing the recruitment activity. And that might mm -hmm. attribute some of this uh, decrease as well as possibly, you know, people taking action, maybe realizing that they have a problem and uh, starting to firewall mm -hmm. things off. But this is encouraging that it's going down this yep. much. Yeah, those would all be uh, uh, accurate observations or, or good observations. You know, one of the things that's interesting here is um, some of us have been doing botnet tracking for quite some time. We've been doing it over the last 10 years, and it's interesting to see how this new wave of botnet operators are relearning a lot of the things that had already been learned by sort of the traditional botnet operators from time some time ago most of those were controlled through an irc channel yes. uh, and then they went to sort of a web-based uh, command and control channel most of the ones now are more of a custom kind of interface but uh, nevertheless they still have uh, learned some of these techniques that is if you are really trying to recruit them you don't necessarily scan so much it might save CPU for doing other things that the botnet's being created for, which uh, obviously is not one of our objectives here. And then looking at the scan probes and sources on port 7547, so we have two sets of activity taking place here. You can see all these little spikes. I think that's really kind of a research organization that are going around looking to see what devices are exposed out there because they was reporting on that, uh, on that topic. And we're looking at, you know, on the order of tens of thousands of sources that are doing this probing activity. So it's certainly a significant number. From what I had seen, it seemed like a lot of the, you know, ISPs would generally be concerned about these devices. It seems like uh, a lot of the problems have been uh, kind of cleared up. So it's gone down significantly from when we had originally seen this uh, at, the be at the end of November last year. It must be that there are some old versions of some of the malware still running, perhaps, mm -hmm. that's generating this activity. But I. I I'm curious if it's actually producing results for, for the operators of these mm. botnets. Perhaps something we should investigate a little bit further. Okay, so with that, let's, uh, you've been taking a lot of uh, a look at the Mirai botnet, and uh, tell me a little bit about these trends that you're observing. Well, it's always nice when the graph looks like this. I wish this was my retirement account. <laughs> 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 Unfortunately, this is the number of samples of Mirai that we've been uh, uh, kind of capturing. So this week we added a new feature to the Internet Weather Report. We wanted to present a little bit more about the botnet analysis work that we do. We focused on taking a look at the extensive research we've done over the past few months on the Mirai botnet. We started our analysis probably in early September here and at the time we only were looking at like 17 malware samples. Uh, but using various techniques over time, we figured out how to get additional samples for analysis. I think the source code was released just a few, uh, like, you know, the time before here. 
And so the number of variants of mm -hmm. the malware, people taking the code, uh, compiling it and sending it out, just increased. And you could see uh, how many samples we ended up. Right now, I think the cumulative is about 728 mm -hmm. uh, samples. You could see that the number of variants uh, has basically doubled over time um, in our tracking system. Mm -hmm. I mean, we went from you know, 33, like in the beginning of February, to then doubling and then doubling and doubling again. So it's going up exponentially. Yeah, so that's not a that's not a great trend. Um, no, I guess. Well, first of all, it looks like here that you sort of have the early experimenters, and then perhaps a number that sort of dropped out after that. Does that yeah. seem reasonable, or are they, or, or some of them just really persisted in using the same version for a period of time? Yeah, I think it was just much fewer actors here, mm -hmm. like you mentioned. So maybe only a few people. So here, right around this time, I believe it was just you know one or maybe two people mm -hmm. who were running the botnet. But as soon as that big attack happened against Krebs, uh, I believe whoever it was that was running it decided maybe I shouldn't be the only one with this version of the source code on my computer. Mm -hmm. So they released it. And I think there was a lot of copycat behavior. And some mm -hmm. of this is actually like researchers, I think, just trying to do different things. But I'm not sure what happened here. This mm -hmm. is, uh, it's not great. Uh, yeah, so as we've seen in the, as we were looking earlier, it seemed like the trend in terms of the number of devices has been going down, or at least what we're seeing right. in scanning activity. But the number of versions of, of malware, malware that are out there, actually new versions of malware that are out there, and obviously cumulatively going up. Uh, is increasing significantly. So uh, we're going to need to keep an eye on that. You know, this was one of the problems that existed for the antivirus vendors in trying to protect against viruses or malware that was created for Windows devices. Perhaps that's uh, sort of the trend toward IoT type devices as well. Yes, I think so. I think even this doesn't even account for all of the packed versions of it mm -hmm. and things like that and all the slight variations. Our work is cut out for us. <laughs> Our work is cut out. Okay. And what's this uh, next one telling us? Uh, so here, from all those uh, malware samples, we're actually trying to see what are the network-based indicators. Mm -hmm. So those are the indicators that are best for like protecting the network, right? So uh, those are the ones we mostly care about. So when we first started the tracking, there were only uh, two IP addresses, two domain names that we knew about. But again, as time went on, and we've been doing this tracking for some time now, the number of indicators has increased as well. So now mm. combined, there are over 400 uh, combined indicators. Now, the thing about them, you could see like here, this bottom chart here kind of mm -hmm. represents um, how it's been going up and down. Over time, it's kind of like a gradual growth. It's not like the doubling. Mm -hmm. This is more like what more my uh, 401k looks like. It's just a <laughs> gradual, slow little growth. That's uh, all the money that you're putting in there. You need yeah, better yeah, investments. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It was interesting to see that the indicators, uh, so the IP addresses and domain names that the botnet uses to kind of keep control, that grew linearly. Basically, it shows that things are, you know, the bad guys are changing all the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's actually happening, I think, where we're observing it, maybe on the order of three to five days for a domain name to stay before they change to a new domain name. And the IP addresses seem to change about daily mm -hmm. uh, for this threat, for the botnet operators who are out there mm -hmm. who are doing this. It's actually a little bit different than some of the approaches that we've seen other botnet operators take, uh, but that seems to be the modus operandi for, uh, for this particular botnet, Mirai. So have you seen the volatility of those addresses or the, the indicators changing as perhaps others more paying attention to what's going on to, to, to try to uh, I think so I think more, I mean I tend to refer to it as resilience that is that ability to adapt to any blocking that gets put into place is uh, oftentimes in order to maintain resilience of that botnet I think so I think some of it must be the, uh, the foresight that mm -hmm. these attackers or botnet operators had uh, to, to be able to say hey you know this is going to happen, so we should try to change our infrastructure out uh, mm -hmm. as, as quickly as possible. Uh, but somewhere here, there was like I think major takedown efforts uh, for Mirai Botnet, mm -hmm. and a mm -hmm. lot of the indicators are actually burned. And we've even observed variants of uh, Mirai malware uh, where they they don't even use the name server from the organization you know, from the router as it's configured. They provide their own name server, kind of like Linksys Moon did. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know. To a few years ago, 
Uh, so we've even seen variants like that mm. that try to use their own domain name servers and things uh, of that nature to, to really evade detection. I, f I feel like some of the takedown efforts are going to be a little bit difficult just because the way these guys operate, their mode of operation is to change. Mm -hmm. So they're not staying static. They're not waiting to get taken down. That's automatically happening. And I think another part of it is that um, I think maybe some of these hosting providers that they go through probably realize that something is amiss here and maybe they get shut down inadvertently as well. Mm -hmm. And that could be more so than takedown efforts. Sometimes I feel like as a hosting operator like realizes, oh, this is, this is strange. Actually, sometime in this period, probably it was right here, we detected a slash 24 being used heavily to host the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And here, it was like one or two IP addresses. And over like a month period, it became the whole slash 24 was bad. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my god, this is, this is the worst thing ever. And then it just disappeared. One mm -hmm. day, the next weekend, it was gone. None of that slash 24 mm -hmm. was available anymore. So I, I attribute that to you know, either takedown activity or possibly that hosting provider said, oh, this is strange. Yeah, not right. This is well, my which best I, customer. Which, so whether it's a localized takedown activity or somebody sort of asked them to take it down. Yeah. Got I kind of hope it was the hosting provider because yeah. that's really probably where it should be, like that more organic abuse. Mm -hmm. So we should shut it down. So if the hosting providers take action, they can probably prevent, you know, this kind of malicious mm -hmm. activity. That's probably where it should be. Okay. And I hope that's what happens. Yeah. All right. Very good. Thanks, Dan. Keep digging. Yes. Let's learn more about it. <laughs> I, I have to say the tagline of the show is, you know, keep your network safe. Is, you know, there's so many threats out there. They're not, they're not stopping. But it's up to you to take measures to protect yourself, your network, and what you're responsible for. And keep your network safe.